Okay, everyone. <clears throat> Can you hear me in the back okay? Brad, is it good? <clears throat> good. So good evening. Oh, come on. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> all right. Good to see you all. So <clears throat> thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Christian Miller. I'm a member of the philosophy department here at Wake Forest, and I'm also in charge of our speaker series this year <clears throat> in the philosophy department. Before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I want to make a couple announcements. Uh, one of the announcements is that <clears throat> for our format tonight is going to be this. We're going to let uh, Dr. Craig speak for about 45 minutes or so, uh, and then there's going to be a time for question and answer. Feel free to come up and ask questions. There are two microphones set up here, uh, and we want to keep your questions short, so if there are a lot of people who want to ask, uh, and we're really looking forward to getting a lot of uh, question and answer and time for discussion as part of this event. In addition, afterwards, after the Q&A period, there'll be a reception in the philosophy department, in the philosophy department library. Now, some of you might not know where that is, so there'll be people stationed outside of Pew Auditorium to direct you to that reception, and everyone's welcome to come, and please feel free to, to stop by for that. There'll be uh, food and beverages at the reception and a chance to interact with the philosophy department and also with Dr. Craig. So, secondly, uh, tonight, Dr. Craig will be giving the Guy T. and Clara Carswell Endowed Philosophy Lecture. Mr. Carswell was a former trustee of Wake Forest University and a distinguished alumnus. In 1960, he made a significant gift to the university in order to establish a lectureship in his and his wife's name. And the purpose of the lectureship was, according to the Carswells, to, quote, deal generally with problems of philosophy relating with Christian truth, unquote. This year's Carswell Lecture is Dr. William Lane Craig. Dr. Craig is a research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in California. He earned a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Birmingham, England, <coughs> before taking a doctorate in theology from the Ludwig Maximilians Universitat in Germany. Sorry, I butchered that. Uh, <coughs> where he was for two years an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow. Prior to his appointment at Talbot, he spent seven years at the Higher Institute of Philosophy at the Catholic Universität in Belgium, which that too, sorry. Um, he has authored or edited over 30 books, including The, the Kalam Cosmologic Argument, Divine Foreknowledge and Human Freedom, Theism, Atheism, and Big Bang Cosmology, and God, Time, and Eternity, as well as over 100 articles in, philosophical, in professional journals of philosophy and theology, including the Journal of Philosophy, American Philosophical Quarterly, Philosophical Studies, Philosophy, and British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. Professor Craig has asked me to uh, be sure and mention his website, www.reasonablefaith.org, uh, where many of his writings can be found if you're interested in reading more of his, his thoughts. Tonight, Dr. Craig will be speaking on the question, as you see, <coughs> why does anything at all exist? Please join me in giving a very warm Wake Forest welcome to Dr. William Lane Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I want to begin by saying how grateful I am to Wake Forest University uh, and to the philosophy department in particular for the honor of delivering this year's Carswell lecture. And I hope that Mr. and Mrs. Carswell would be pleased with uh, what transpires here this evening. I also want to thank each of you for coming out and spending this Friday night thinking about such important topics and I hope that at the end of the evening you will also agree that this has been well worth it. Keokuk, Iowa was a great place to grow up as a boy. It's on the banks of the mighty Mississippi River in the southeastern toe of Iowa that hangs down over Missouri. Keokuk is in Mark Twain territory. As kids, we had virtually every kind of pet that we could catch. Frogs, snakes, salamanders, rabbits, birds, stray cats and dogs that wandered by our house, even a bat and a possum. You could also see the, the stars clearly at night in Keokuk. I remember as a boy looking up at the stars, innumerable, in the black night, and thinking, where did all this come from? It seemed to me instinctively that there had to be an explanation of why all this exists. As long as I can remember then, I've always believed in a creator 
of the universe. Only years later did I come to realize that my boyhood question, as well as its answer, had occupied the minds of some of the greatest philosophers for centuries. For example, G.W. Leibniz, a prodigious scholar of 18th century Germany um, and the founder of the calculus, wrote the first question which should rightly be asked is why is there something rather than nothing? In other words, why does anything at all exist? This, for Leibniz, is the most fundamental question that a person can ask. Like me, Leibniz came to the conclusion that the answer is to be found not in the universe of created things, but in God. God exists necessarily and is the explanation why anything else exists. We can put Leibniz's thinking into the form of a simple argument. This has the advantage of making his logic very clear and focusing our attention on the central steps of his reasoning. And it also serves to make his argument very easy to memorize. There are basically three steps or premises in Leibniz's reasoning. Number one, everything that, be, uh, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence. Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence. Two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. And three, the universe exists. That's it. Now, what follows logically from these three premises? Well, look at premises one and three. If everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, and the universe exists, then it follows logically that four, therefore the universe has an explanation of its existence. Now notice that premise two says that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. And we've seen in premise four, or step four, that the universe has an explanation of its existence. And so from two and four, it logically follows that therefore the explanation of the universe's existence is God. Now, this is a logically airtight argument. That is to say, if the three premises are true, then the conclusion is unavoidable. It doesn't matter if you don't like the conclusion. It doesn't matter if you have other objections to God's existence. So long as you grant the premises, you have to accept the conclusion. So, if anyone wants to uh, reject the conclusion, he has to say that one of the three premises is false. But which one will he reject? Premise three, that the universe exists, I think is indisputable for anyone who is a sincere inquirer after truth. Obviously, the universe exists. So the argument's detractor is going to have to deny either one or two if he wants to remain an atheist and be rational. So the whole question comes down to this. Are premises one and two true or are they false? Well, let's look at them. At first blush, premise one seems vulnerable to an obvious objection. If everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, and God exists, then God must have an explanation of his existence. But that seems absurd, for then the explanation of God's existence would have to be some other being greater than God. But since that's impossible, premise one must be false. Some things must be able to exist without any explanation. The theist will say that God exists inexplicably. The atheist will say, why, why not just stop with the universe? The universe just exists inexplicably. So we seem to reach 
a stalemate. Well, not so fast. This obvious objection to premise one is based on a misunderstanding of what Leibniz meant by an explanation. In Leibniz's view, there are two kinds of things. A, things that exist necessarily, and B, things which are produced by some external cause. Let me explain. Things which exist necessarily exist by a necessity of their own nature. It's impossible for them not to exist. Many mathematicians think that numbers, sets, and other mathematical objects exist in this way. They're not caused to exist by something else. They just exist by the necessity of their own nature. By contrast, things that are caused to exist by something else don't exist necessarily. They exist because something else has produced them. Familiar physical objects like people, planets, and galaxies belong to this category. So when Leibniz says that everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, that explanation may be found either in the necessity of a thing's own nature or else in some external cause. So premise one could be revised in the following way. One star, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. But now the objection falls to the ground. For the explanation of God's existence lies in the necessity of his own nature. As even the atheist recognizes, it's impossible for God to have a cause. So Leibniz's argument is really an argument for God as a necessary, uncaused being. Far from undermining Leibniz's argument, the atheist's objection to premise one actually helps to clarify and magnify who God is. If God exists, then he is a necessarily existing, uncaused being. So what reason might be offered for thinking that premise one is true? Well, when you reflect on it, premise one has a sort of self-evidence about it. Imagine that you're walking through the woods and you come upon a translucent ball lying on the forest floor. You would automatically wonder how it came to be there. If one of your hiking partners said to you, don't worry about it, it just exists inexplicably, you'd either think that he was crazy or you figured that he just wanted you to keep on moving. No one would take seriously the suggestion that the ball existed there with literally no explanation. Now, suppose you increase the size of the ball in this story so that it's the size of a car. That wouldn't do anything to remove or to satisfy the demand for an explanation. Suppose it were the size of a house. Same problem. Suppose it were the size of a continent or a planet. Same problem. Suppose it were the size of the entire universe. Same problem. Merely increasing the size of the ball does nothing to affect the need of an explanation. Now, sometimes atheists will say that premise one is true of everything in the universe, but is not true of the universe itself. Everything in the universe has an explanation, but the universe itself has no explanation. But this response commits what has aptly been called the taxicab uh, fallacy. As the 19th century uh, atheist philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer quipped, premise one can't be dismissed like a hack once you've arrived at your desired destination. You can't say that everything has an explanation of its existence and then suddenly exempt the universe. It would be arbitrary for the atheist to claim that the universe is the exception to the rule. Recall 
that Leibniz does not make God an exception to the premise one. Our illustration of the ball in the woods showed that merely increasing the size of the ball, even until it becomes uh, coextensive with the entire universe, does nothing to remove the need for some explanation of its existence. Notice, too, how unscientific this atheist response is. For modern cosmology, the study of the large-scale structure of the universe, is devoted to a search for an explanation of the universe's existence. The atheist attitude would cripple science. So, some atheists have tried to justify making the universe an exception to premise one. They say that it's impossible for the universe to have an explanation of its existence. Why? Well, because the explanation of the universe would have to be some prior state of affairs in which the universe did not yet exist. But that would be nothingness, and nothingness cannot be the explanation of anything. So the universe must just exist inexplicably. This line of reasoning is, however, obviously fallacious, for it just assumes that the universe is all there is, so that if there were no universe, there would be nothing. In other words, the objection assumes that atheism is true. The atheist is thus begging the question, arguing in a circle. Leibniz would agree that the explanation of the universe must be a prior state of affairs in which the universe did not exist. But that state of affairs is God and his will, not nothingness. So it seems that premise one is more plausibly true than false, which is all that we need for a good argument. What then about premise two? that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Is it more plausibly true than false? Well, what's really awkward for the atheist at this point is that premise two is logically equivalent to the typical atheist response to Leibniz's argument. Two statements are logically equivalent if it's impossible for one to be true and the other to be false. They stand or fall together. So what does the atheist typically say in response to Leibniz's argument? As we've just seen, the atheist typically asserts something like the following. A, if atheism is true, the universe has no explanation of its existence. This is precisely what the atheist said in response to premise one the universe just exists inexplicably. But A is logically equivalent to saying B, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, then atheism is not true. A and B are logically equivalent. If atheism is true, the universe has no explanation of its existence. If the universe has an explanation of its existence, then atheism is not true true, so that A and B uh, are logically equivalent. So you can't affirm A and deny B. But B is virtually synonymous with premise two, that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. So by saying, in response to premise one, that given atheism, the universe has no explanation, the atheist is implicitly admitting premise two, that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, then God exists. And if the universe has an explanation, uh, according to premise two, that explanation is God. Besides that, premise two is very plausible in its own right. For think of what the universe is, all of space and time, all of space-time reality, including all matter and energy. It follows that if the universe has a cause of its existence, 
that cause must be a non-physical, immaterial being beyond space and time. This is amazing. Now, there are only two sorts of things that can fit that description. Either an abstract object, like a number, or else an unembodied mind. But abstract objects can't cause anything. That's part of what it means to be abstract. The number seven, for example, uh, can't cause any effects. So the cause of the existence of the universe cannot be an abstract object. It must therefore be a transcendent mind, which is what believers understand God to be. So I hope you begin to grasp the power of Leibniz's argument. If successful, it proves the existence of a necessary, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, personal creator of the universe. This is not some ill-conceived uh, flying spaghetti monster, but an ultra-mundane being with many of the properties of the god of traditional theism. This is truly mind-blowing. So what can the atheist say at this point? Well, he has a more radical alternative open to him. He can retrace his steps, withdraw his objection to premise one, and say instead, yes, the universe does have an explanation of its existence, but that explanation is the universe exists by a necessity of its own nature. For the atheist, the universe could serve as a sort of God substitute which exists necessarily. Now, this would be a very radical step for the atheist to take, and I can't think of any contemporary atheist philosopher who has, in fact, taken this line. A few years ago at a Philosophy of Time conference at City College in Santa Barbara, California, I thought that Professor Adolf Grunbaum, a vociferous atheistic philosopher of science from the University of Pittsburgh, was flirting with this idea. But when I raised the question from the floor uh, whether he thought that the universe existed necessarily, he was quite indignant at the suggestion. Of course not, he snapped. And he went on to say that the universe just exists without any explanation. The reason why atheists are not eager to embrace this alternative is clear. As we look about the universe, none of the things that make it up, whether stars, planets, galaxies, dust, radiation, or what have you, seems to exist necessarily. They could all fail to exist. Indeed, at some point in the past, when the universe was very dense, none of them did exist. But someone might say, what about the matter of which these things are made? Maybe the matter exists necessarily, and all these things are just different configurations of matter. The problem with this suggestion is that according to the standard model of subatomic physics, matter itself is composed of tiny particles called quarks. The universe just is the collection of all these quarks arranged in different ways. But now the question arises, couldn't a collection of different quarks have existed instead of this one? Does each and every one of these quarks exist necessarily? It seems crazy to say that each and every quark in the universe exists by a necessity of its own nature so that this is the only collection of quarks that could possibly have existed. Notice what the atheist cannot say at this point. He cannot say that the quarks are just configurations of matter, which could have been different, but that the matter of which the quarks are composed exists necessarily. He can't say this because the quarks aren't composed of anything. They just are the basic units of matter. So if a quark doesn't exist, the matter doesn't exist. But it seems obvious that a different collection of 
quarks could have existed instead of the collection that does in fact exist. But if that were the case, then a different universe would have existed. To see the point, think about your shoes, the ones that you have on right now. Could the shoes that you're wearing have been made of steel? Now certainly we can imagine that you could have had a pair of steel shoes, the same shape and size as the shoes that you're wearing, but that's not my question. The question is whether the very shoes you're wearing, whether those shoes could have been made of steel. I think the answer is obviously not. They would be a different pair of shoes, not the same pair of shoes that you have on. And the same is true of the universe a universe made up of different quarks, even if identically arranged as in this universe, would be a different universe. One thinks of the famous case of the indigent man who darned his silk stockings with wool until he finally wound up with a pair of wool stockings. But wool stockings were clearly not identical to the original silk stockings. Now, it might be said that if the man had darned his socks with silk, then the ultimate outcome would have been the same pair of stockings, despite their having none of the matter of the original pair, or less controversial. I remain identical over time, despite a complete exchange of the material constituents of my body for new constituents. Analogously, it might be said, Universes could be identical across possible worlds, even though they are composed of wholly different collections of quarks. The disanalogy, however, is that the difference across possible worlds is no kind of change at all, for there is no enduring subject which undergoes intrinsic change from one state to another. So it is more like the case of comparing pairs of stockings or human bodies which have no connection with each other whatsoever. My claim here becomes even more obvious when we reflect that it seems entirely possible that the fundamental building blocks of nature could have been substances quite different from quarks and so characterized by different laws of nature. Even if the basic laws of nature are taken to be broadly logically necessary, it's possible that different laws of nature could have held because substances endowed with different dispositions and capacities than quarks could have existed instead. To think that in such a case we should be dealing with the same universe would be like thinking that a particular pane of glass, uh, say the windshield in your car, uh, could retain its identity if it had been made of steel. This is obviously absurd. No atheist, I think, will be so bold as to suggest that some quarks, though qualitatively uh, identical to ordinary quarks, have the special occult property of being metaphysically necessary. It's all or nothing here. But no one thinks that every quark exists by a necessity of its own nature. It follows that neither does the universe composed of such quarks exist by a necessity of its own nature. Notice that this is the case whether we think of the universe as an object in its own right, just as a block of marble is not identical to a block of the same shape constituted by different marble, or if we think of the universe as an aggregate or group just as a flock of birds is not identical to a similar flock composed of different birds. Or even if we think of the universe as nothing at all over and above the quarks themselves. A second reason for thinking that the universe does not exist by a necessity of its own nature is that we have strong astrophysical evidence that the universe began to exist. An essential property of a necessary being is eternality, that is to say, being without beginning or end. Anything which comes into existence at a certain time can fail to exist. 
and therefore is not necessary in its being. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so startling is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves, come into being at the Big Bang. As the physicist P.C.W. Davies explains, the coming into being of the universe, as discussed in modern science, is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. Of course, alternative theories have been proposed over the years to try to avoid this absolute beginning, but none of these theories has commended itself to the scientific community as more plausible than the Big Bang Theory. In fact, in 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning. Vilenkin pulls no punches. I quote, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning." End quote. The beginning of the universe not only reveals the contingency of the universe, it also shows the universe to be contingent in a very special way. It came into existence from nothing. This is significant, for it not only undermines the claim of the radical atheist who maintains that the universe exists by a necessity of its own nature, but it also thrusts the more traditional atheist who would answer Leibniz by holding that the universe is the exception to the principle of sufficient reason, uh, that it exists inexplicably, into a very awkward position of maintaining not merely that the universe exists eternally without an explanation, but rather that for no reason at all it magically popped into being out of nothing, a position which might make theism look like a welcome alternative. So atheists have not been so bold as to deny premise two and say that the universe exists necessarily. Premise two also seems to be plausibly true. But then given that the universe exists, the remainder of the argument follows. There's one last way that the atheist might try to escape Leibniz's argument. He might say that while there are no beings that exist necessarily, nevertheless it is necessary that something or other exist. He will agree with the theist that it is impossible that nothing exist, but he thinks that the proper conclusion to be drawn from this fact is not that a necessary being exists, but that necessarily some contingent being or other exists. This is akin to saying that while necessarily every object has a shape, nonetheless, there is no particular shape which everything necessarily has. In the same way, it's necessary that something or other exist, but there isn't anything that exists necessarily. In short, premise one is on this view false after all. The universe exists contingently and inexplicably. Some universe must exist, yes, but there is no explanation why the universe exists. Alexander Proust has pointed out that this view 
has an extremely implausible consequence. It's plausible that no conjunction of claims about the non-existence of various beings entails, say, that a unicorn exists. After all, how could the fact that certain things do not exist entail that some other contingent thing does exist? But on the present atheist view, the conjunction, there are no mountains, there are no people, there are no planets, there are no rocks, etc., etc., including everything that is not a unicorn, entails that there is a unicorn. For if it is necessary that contingent beings exist, and none of the other contingent beings exist, then the only thing left is a unicorn. Hence, a conjunction about the non-existence of certain things entails that a unicorn exists, which seems absurd. Moreover, on this view, there is nothing which would account for why there exist contingent beings in every possible world. Since there is no necessary being, there's nothing that could cause contingent beings to exist in every possible world, and no explanation why every world includes contingent beings. There is no uh, strict logical inconsistency in the concept of a world which is devoid of contingent beings. What accounts for the fact that in every possible world contingent beings exist? Given the infinity of broadly logically possible worlds, the odds that in all of them contingent beings just happen inexplicably to exist is infinitesimal. Hence, the probability of the atheist's hypothesis is effectively zero. Hence, this last gambit fails as well. In conclusion, then, given the truth of the three premises, the conclusion is logically inescapable. God is the explanation of the universe's existence. Moreover, the argument implies that God is an uncaused, unembodied mind which transcends the physical universe and even space and time themselves and who exists necessarily. And he is the explanation for why anything at all exists. Well, that completes uh, the thoughts that I wanted to share with you this evening, so now we'll open it to any questions that you might have. I'm going to avail myself of this chair for this part of it the evening. Okay, go ahead. Really enjoyed it. I appreciate you coming. Um, Thank you. Would it be all right if I ask two questions, one of which is a clarification question? Yes, of course. Okay, uh, the first premise, um, everything that exists has an explanation. Is the explanation coterminous with cause? And if no. it is, it's not. Okay, how not? Well, because, as I said, for things that exist by a necessity of their own nature, they're uncaused. So take numbers, for example. Many mathematicians think that numbers exist necessarily, but they're not caused by anything. Uh, they just exist by a necessity of their own nature. They're logically necessary beings, and so it's impossible that they not exist. Okay. okay. Um, the second question would be, how'd you, how would you respond to a uh, Humean-style skepticism? Uh, David Hume which says, um, we can't have any ideas which first don't come through our impressions. Because if we, uh, if we can't have an idea that doesn't come through the impression, how do we talk of necessary being? Yeah. Well, even Hume, um, I think, would obviously agree with the laws of logic. So that laws of logic and, and mathematics, I, I would, he would think of these as, as analytic truths that, that are not uh, informative, but I'm trying to think of um, what in this argument would be something that is a priori. I, I mean, it, the, the defense that I gave of premise one uh, did appeal to experience, uh, so I, I guess I don't see that 
even for a Humean, this argument is so unacceptable. And, and I, of course, one could just challenge that, that notion, too, that, that, that the only informative truths that we know are found through sense impressions. Mathematics, for example, uh, are generally not regarded as, as part of logic. That was a project that Bertrand Russell and Whitehead pursued to try to show that mathematics is just an extension of logic, but that project failed. There are mathematical truths that seem to be logically necessary, but they're not just by definition. They're not just analytically true. So I think one could easily challenge this Humean dogma. Um, but even given it, this isn't a sort of a priori argument. It, it does appeal to experience. Yes. I actually have two questions and one follows into the other. Okay. Uh, the first is, how would you respond to uh, someone bringing up the statement that human beings are at least four-dimensional in the fact that we have the three physical dimensions along with time, uh, you know, and that regardless of any other ex dimensions that human beings may or may not exist in, those four are very apparent and you know, even the most diehard atheist would acknowledge the existence of all four. That being said, if human beings are limited in our perception of the reality around us, could you say that the universe does have an explanation? There was a prior state of events before the inception of the universe, but however, that prior state of affairs is not explainable uh, through our limited perception of reality. If we have a, if you know, if we're looking at the universe through a, uh, with tunnel vision and incapable of perceiving it in a ideal and potentially uh, complete perception, can it be that the universe has an explanation for its existence, but that we simply are not capable of explaining no. it? I don't think that there's anything in this argument that's at all inconsistent with thinking of reality as being four-dimensional in nature, that, we, uh, that, that the ultimate space-time reality is this sort of four-dimensional geometrical object, and we're a part of that. Right. Um, the, the question that Leibniz would want to know is why does that four-dimensional space-time reality exist? What is the explanation of its existence? And to uh, explain that, you're going to have to appeal to something then that is beyond space and time. And it gets right into the argument then that, that I gave that will lead you to, I think, a, a theistic concept of God. So do you think it's possible that do you think it's possible that there is an explanation that is that does explain the inception of a four-dimensional reality that we exist in that is not does not necessitate the existence of the God? Um, not without positing, I think, further higher dimensions. Oh, but then, yeah, then with, you, I mean, if you do that, then Leibniz will simply ask for the reason for the existence of that thing. What is the uh, explanation for the existence of, say, this 11-dimensional uh, uh, st superstring theoretical model of the universe, of which our four-dimensional four -dimensional universe is our perceptual experience. And so it will just push the argument back a notch, and the whole argument can be run, rerun again on that higher dimensional reality. So Leibniz would just say that regardless of the existence of an, any number of higher or extra dimensions, the logic of his original three suppositions does not actually change simply because th even those would have to exist in our understanding of existence, and if that's the case, then the explanations would have to just, it would That's move right. The, the word universe, uh, where it appears in premise two, will simply expand to okay. take in these extra dimensions of space and time that go beyond the four that we experience. And the question then will be, what is the explanation of the existence of this multiverse, if you will, right. of which our universe is a part? So this argument, as Leibniz gave it, isn't wedded to a particular cosmology at all. Okay, that was basically mm -hmm. my question. Just for a little clarification, uh, you've mentioned a couple times things like numbers of the laws of logic as being things that are of, that are, exist of necessity and would therefore be uncaused, and they, they have to exist or eternal kind of thing. But if that's true, would those not be then elements of the universe that 
exist of necessity. Therefore, even if God did not exist, they would still exist. And so therefore, that would be something that exists apart from God and therefore contradicting. Yes, you, you should have come to my philosophy colloquium paper that I gave this afternoon, <laughs> uh, which was on that subject. I don't think there are other necessary beings than okay. God. But I use the example of mathematical objects as an illustration to help people understand the idea of a necessary being who have never confronted this notion before. There are many mathematicians and philosophers who do believe that mathematical objects exist and exist necessarily. And indeed, they think there are lots of these necessary beings, not just mathematical objects, but things like propositions, uh, properties, uh, functions, um, all sorts of things that are posited as necessarily existing objects. I don't believe in the existence of those things myself for the reason that you just stated. But nevertheless, they would serve as possible candidates for the office of necessary being uh, in case someone wonders, well, what are you talking about? OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> What part of this argument denies the existence of many necessary beings or even a necessary force rather than a necessary God? Yeah. Um, I don't think there's anything in this argument that denies that there could be a plurality of necessary beings. So my reason for responding to the last question was uh, a theological reason, that uh, for theological reasons, I don't think that there's a plurality of necessary beings. But there's nothing in this argument, it seems to me, that says that there could not be a plurality of necessary beings. So God could be just a necessary force, or even there could be multiple necessary beings rather than just one? Right. For example, suppose you do believe that numbers exist necessarily, then the argument would give you God and all of these numbers uh, as part of what you believe exists. Um, there would be God plus all these numbers. Or maybe you believe there are propositions in addition to God um, that exist as necessary beings. But you, you still have to get an explanation of the universe's existence. And as I said, an abstract object won't be able to give you that because abstract objects like numbers and propositions don't have causal effects. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so if you were to say to me, well then on what basis would you justify believing, if on this argument alone, in believing that there's only one God, I think I would just say Occam's razor, which says don't postulate causes beyond necessity. We're only warranted in positing such causes as are necessary to explain the effect. And multiplying causes beyond necessity would be a violation of, of Occam's razor. So uh, for that reason, we would be warranted in accepting the existence of God as the best explanation of the universe. But we would be unwarranted if we were to go on and infer that there's a plurality of such beings. OK, thank you. Uh -huh. um, a question I've struggled with is what God's motive um, would have been in the first place for creative creating the universe um, anyway and does do any of these have can you explain that kind of or? no this argument just gets you to the existence of God as the sufficient reason for the existence of the universe but it doesn't say anything about his motivation I would respond to that again from the standpoint of theology if you think of God as a self-sufficient being who has no need of anything outside himself, there cannot be any need that he had to satisfy in order to create the universe. We shouldn't think of God as being lonely or needing company, and therefore he made creatures to uh, be his companions or anything. So given that God is a perfect, self-sufficient being, the only reason that I can think for his producing creatures would be for the benefit of the creatures themselves. It would be to create finite persons in his image who are capable of coming into relationship with himself, the fount of all goodness and infinite value and love and truth 
uh, and allowing these finite persons to have the privilege of knowing him as the highest good. So that creation would be for the benefit and the sake of the creatures, not for the sake and benefit of the creator. So that on this view, creation, like salvation, is completely by grace alone. It would be completely by grace that creation takes place. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, Hi. So I worry about number one, and I think about why we might find it plausible in the first place. And so I think it does have a lot of original plausibility. You see things, and you wonder, well, how did that happen, and why is that there as you sort of go about your day? Everything we see on a daily basis seems to be created. Um, but then, as we find out more about the way the world works and it's sort of the scientific details about subatomic particles, it seems like the more you find out, the weirder things get. Yeah. And as the weirder things get, it seems like I'm less inclined to think that there needs to be an explanation of those things because the kinds of things that we're talking about um, are very different. So between regular ordinary objects and subatomic objects, it seems like they're really very different and so different that maybe number one doesn't apply to, say, subatomic yeah. objects. Yeah. And likewise, I think actually as you scale up, number one also might not apply, or at least my inclination to apply number one to the whole universe kind of goes away as I start thinking bigger and bigger. Uh -huh. Well, I've already given my response to the second part of that question, and that is just increasing the size of the object. Mm -hmm. I just can't see anything in that that would remove the need for or satisfy the demand for an explanation. Now, with respect to, to quantum events or subatomic events, notice that this is deliberately formulated to try to avoid saying that every event has an explanation. This is entirely consistent with there being events that are purely random or uncaused or the product of free will or something of this sort. Uh, what this is uh, talking about is that things that exist have to have an explanation for their being. And that is not violated in quantum physics. The quantum vacuum, which underlies all of physical reality, is a sea of fluctuating energy and is the, the cause for things like virtual particles that arise out of the vacuum, have a brief existence, and then disappear back into the vacuum again. So that even on indeterministic accounts of quantum events, uh, it isn't the case that, uh, that these things, that things exist that have no explanation of their, their being, quite the contrary. Moreover, I want to add this, that although the equations, the mathematics of quantum mechanics has been fantastically verified to uh, an incredible degree of accuracy. There are at least 10 different physical interpretations of the mathematics that I can think of, uh, and most of those are thoroughly deterministic. It's only uh, interpretations like the Copenhagen interpretation, which has indeterminism in it, that is really ontological rather than epistemic. Uh, so that um, most of the interpretations, most of the physical interpretations of quantum mechanics are thoroughly deterministic and uh, would be present no problem at all to every event or every thing that exists having an explanation. And nobody knows which of these 10 interpretations, if any, is correct. Uh, indeed, many physicists are very dissatisfied with what's sometimes called the mumbo jumbo, the Copenhagen interpretation, precisely because of the sort of quantum weirdness that you described. We, we're not by any means committed by the um, evidence or by the mathematical formulism to this kind of uh, weird uh, Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, there are other interpretations that are completely deterministic. And so there's nothing in experimental science that would force us to, or even cause us to think that premise one is not true. And, um, and to someone who sort of, whose inclination to accept premise one decreases at different sizes, would you just say that they're not being consistent? Um, yes, I, I, I'm not sure what more I could say to someone like that, except maybe to try to do it 
as I did in a sort of gradualist way. And, and I think they would find themselves in a very difficult situation of saying, well, when does the object become big enough that it no longer needs an explanation? Or what, at what centimeter increase will it cross that line? And, and then challenge him to tell me something about the object that now makes it in need of an explanation that it didn't have before. And I, I hope that that would elicit a much enough discomfort in the person to say, why am I being so skeptical and digging in my heels about this? Uh, this ought to be the default position. Uh, I think the default position is that things have explanations, unless you can give some good reason as to why it doesn't have or can't have an explanation. Oh, Go ahead. So, um, looking at premise number one, um, the reason you gave that the universe has to have an external cause and cannot necessarily exist is because it seems to have been, it's expanding and it seems to have been created at a, at a moment that it did not exist and then it existed, hence it can't necessarily exist. Um, almost, almost. I gave actually two reasons why I think that the universe doesn't exist by a necessity of its own nature. My first one was based upon the fact that um, it seems that uh, everything in the universe is contingent, including the quarks of which it's made, and that therefore it seems obvious that a different collection of quarks could exist than those that do. The atheist would have to say, not simply that the universe exists necessarily, but that every single quark exists by a necessity of its own nature, and that just seems crazy to me. That was the first argument based this upon the composition of the universe. The second one was the fact that any necessarily existing being has to exist eternally. Um, and therefore, if something begins to exist, that shows that it could fail to exist and therefore is not necessary in its being. I wouldn't put that as you did, where you said something like you said, the universe didn't exist and then it did. It's more radical than that because there isn't any then prior to the existence of the universe. This is the beginning of time itself. So there is no before at which the universe did not exist. It's rather that the universe came into existence along with space and time a finite time ago. Okay, then if I may, I guess I'll, I'll just change the example that I thought sure. of. That was what I wanted to clarify. I was trying to think of a reason that the universe might necessarily exist, but now I think I just have an idea for why it might have eternally existed. So think about perhaps if all the if all the black if all the black holes in the universe eventually swallow up all the matter in the universe and then they swallow up each other and everything is reduced to a singularity. Yes. Right? This is probably going to happen. Then perhaps at that moment a force can be created that would cause it all to expand again just like it did in the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And this would mean that perhaps for that moment time is again included, but then time would come to be again. And this may have happened before our Big Bang, such that the universe may be doing this over and over again, contracting and expanding, contracting and expanding. So then there wouldn't have to be the explanation of an external cause to create it out of nothing. Yeah. But it would just be expanding and, and shrinking again. Right. Uh, these types of models were called oscillating models, and they were floated in the 1960s. And the Hawking Penrose singularity theorems tended to put a death knell to these oscillating models because what the singularity theorem showed was, as you said, that a universe that is in gravitational self collapse will go down to a singularity and that there time and space will simply come to an end. It's physically impossible for anything to pass through a singularity to re expand and to start a new universe ag uh, again. So that the the uh, model uh, is physically impossible. You would have to have some sort of new physics that is contrary to what we now know in order for this to happen. A second difficulty is that if the universe could oscillate like that, uh, scientists discovered that entropy would be conserved from cycle to cycle. That is to say, the second law of thermodynamics would show that entropy would continue to increase in each oscillation. 
And this has the peculiar effect of making each oscillation have a larger radius and a longer expansion time so that the cycles or the expansions would get bigger and bigger and bigger. What that means is as you trace the cycles back in time, they get smaller and smaller and smaller until you finally come to an absolute beginning of the universe. So that this multi-cycle model you described has an infinite future, but it only has a finite past. So that it turns out not to avoid the beginning of the universe that its original uh, modelers uh, crafted it to avoid. There are other versions of the oscillating models that are back in discussion again today, but uh, none of them has been able to be extended into the infinite past. Uh, that's the real difficulty. The, the, the problem is not just how do you get the universe to bounce you know, from a contraction to a, an expansion, but how can you extend it into the infinite past? And that has uh, that's been uh, the nettlesome problem with all of these oscillating models is that uh, they can't seem to be extended to infinity past. I guess at least in, able, in order to be able to do that, you would need some kind of new physics, which we have no access to. Not right, to right. It would have to be something that is contrary to what we do know now of, of physics. Uh, and of course, that's always possible. That's why science is always tentative. Uh, but one can say that Leibniz's argument, I think, enjoys the support of contemporary science. Thanks. So can you compare like the necessity of God versus the necessity of the universe? Or is there not a good equivocation there? Because, you know, like you mentioned earlier that some radical atheist might go to the point of saying that um, the universe is necessary. Yes. Would that then also entail that some radical theologians would say that God was necessary? I'm just wondering what the well, what the disconnect there. That, that that wouldn't be the analogy because it is the conservative traditional theologians who say that God exists necessarily. That's Leibniz's view that God is a necessary being. That's the traditional view. Um, and we would be meaning it in exactly the same way. We would mean that there is, there is no possible world in which God fails to exist, or the radical atheist, there's no possible world in which our universe fails to exist. Um, so the use of the word necessary there is the same for both of those. There's no equivocation. The question just is, is it plausible to think that our universe exists necessarily in that way? And I gave two arguments as to why I think that that's quite implausible. Okay, I just needed a clarification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. I have a, a couple of questions. The first has to do with the, uh, the necessary, the necessity of its own nature being. And uh, at one point you call it, it either has to be an abstract number of some sort or an uh, unembodied mind. Yes. And at one point you mentioned a couple of necessary qualities that such an unbodied mind would have to possess, including uh, timelessness, spacelessness, and immaterialism. Yes. Um, but then you added one at the very end that it, ha it would have to be personal. Yes. And I was wondering why, why such a being would necessi necessitate uh, personableness. Well, I take it that that's what a mind is, uh, that a mind is, is a person. Um, so uh, to me, as I was using the word mind, that, that was what I meant. OK. Good. The second question. Uh, <laughs> the second question has to do with those beings that uh, exist based on an external cause. Uh -huh. and. Um, so if something exists based on an external cause, uh, that means that human beings, we're, we, we exist based on external causes. And I was wondering if this uh, necessitates determinism. That is to say, you know, you coming to Wake Forest and presenting this argument, you, you know, happened because it was impossible for anything else to do so or for anyone else in the audience to accept or reject this argument uh, happens because it was impossible for anything else yeah. to happen. And if, and if uh, this, you know, these external causes necessitate determinism, 
why why would mm -hmm. any of what we're talking about matters? Right. The, well, yeah, does this allow us to retain free will? I, I think it does because, as I said to the other fellow here who asked about these quantum events, which are indeterminate, like the decay of a radioactive isotope, that, that seems to be unpredictable. A and I said I deliberately formulated premise one to be consistent with the fact that not every event has a cause. I, now Leibniz, I think, did think that every event has a cause. His premise one was actually much stronger than this. His principle of sufficient reason was very strong that every truth, every fact has an explanation of its existence. And mine is much, much more modest. Mine is simply that anything that exists has an explanation of its existence. And that's quite compatible with freedom of the will, quantum indeterminacy, randomness, and things of that sort. So I don't think it, it uh, precludes those. So you would say that, okay. you, so you would say that thoughts and actions and motivations wouldn't exist in the same way that material objects exist? Um, right, I, I guess that, that is what I would say, I okay. think. Thank you. Uh -huh. I just want to ask you a quick clarification. Um, earlier there was a question about whether this argument could lead to multiple necessary beings. Yes. And I was thinking that through and I was wondering um, if, it's, if it's necessary that a necessary being be infinite. How could you have more than one of them? Because if they're both infinite, aren't they the same thing? This is a good question. I, it's not obvious to me that this gives you the infinity of the necessary being. Now maybe, maybe you could provide some supplementary argumentation, but I, I didn't ever claim, and I'm not clear how, showing that the universe has an explanation of its existence in a necessary being would show that that necessary being is infinite. Well, but it can't be dependent on anything else, can it? Right, it couldn't depend on anything else, but when you say infinite, well, I guess maybe you need to clarify what you mean by that. Like, it wouldn't show that it's omnipotent, or omniscient, okay. all-knowing or all-powerful. I mean, it wouldn't show that this being is all-powerful or all-knowing. No, it might be. So it can still be limited, even though it's a necessary being? Right, right. For example, the number seven. If you're, if you're a mathematician who believes in numbers, the number seven would necessarily exist, but it wouldn't be all-powerful. In fact, it has no power at all. It's, it's completely feat. So being necessary doesn't mean that you're endowed with a great deal of, of power, um, unless you could provide some sort of supplementary argument. For example, here's an argument that the medieval philosophers sometimes gave. If God is the cause of the universe out of nothing, then he must be all powerful because there is, so to speak, an infinite distance between being and non-being. And to bring something into being, not out of previously existing materials, but to bring something absolutely into being would require infinite power. So that one might try to argue from the fact that the universe has been created from nothing, that this necessary being must have infinite power. And I find that to be an attractive argument. I, I like that argument. I think that's plausible. But that would be, as I say, supplementary to this uh, rather than really a part of this. Okay. And I want to say, if you do have being a being that is necessarily existing and infinite in power, then I agree with you. I don't think you could have more than one of them. Because if you had more than one of them, they would limit each other. It would be like the irresistible force and the immovable object. And so if you have a being of infinite power, I think there can only be one of them because Otherwise, the other being is not within the first one's power. And therefore, it's not all powerful or infinite in power after all. So we may be very, getting very close to uh, what, what you want to suggest here. Uh, I think you can see plausible lines of argument for arguing for monotheism, uh, using this argument as a springboard and then adding some of these supplementary thoughts. Yep. Richard Swinburne is a philosopher from Oxford University, and he argues along these lines that it's logically impossible for there to be two omnipotent beings. That if there is an omnipotent being, 
there can only be one of them. And I do find that persuasive. But the question would be, how do you show that there is an omnipotent being? And I don't think this argument proves that, but it, it, it could prove, perhaps, a being of infinite power in that sense of creating something from nothing. And that would, that would get you, perhaps, to the same conclusion. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. curious about the uh, <coughs> argument on mathematics, or excuse me, numbers, that mm -hmm. they necessarily exist. Yeah. Because uh, when I was in grade school, actually junior high, when the subject of division by zero would come up, we would uh. go, well, that's undefined, and that would end the argument. <coughs> it's undefined. <coughs> and by the same token, an atheist could say what existed before the singularity of the Big Bang, well, you can, or an atheist would say, well, that's undefined, so there's no point in going into that. Mm -hmm. And to use the terminology of uh, infinite, I think I learned in uh, geometry that a line one inch long has an infinite number of points, yes. so does a line that's uh, two feet long or a line that's nine miles long. So infinite <coughs> is a term that's kind of undefined in my mind as far as numbers go. I mean, how, how would I, being that I am, a, I consider myself a Christian, and I like to get into discussions with atheists, <clears throat> when that argument comes up, well, it's undefined, so there's no point in talking about it. Okay. You've raised some really interesting questions, and let me try to tease these <laughs> apart and get at them. When mathematicians say that division by zero is undefined, what that means is that it, it cannot have an answer because it leads to self-contradictions. If you try to do division by zero, you can wind up proving self-contradictions. But there is no self-contradiction in the view of contemporary cosmology or Big Bang theory that time and space came into being at the singularity about 13.7 billion years ago. So when you say, it's undefined what existed before. You're not using the word in the same way that mathematicians use that word when they say that division by zero is undefined. There's no contradiction in Big Bang cosmology or thinking that the universe and time and space had an absolute beginning, and there was simply nothing before it. There, it, it just, that was the beginning. There's, there's nothing undefined about that in any objectionable sense. Now, with respect to infinity, the idea that a line has an infinite number of points, regardless of the length of the line, or even in a plane, I, you could extend it, a plane has the same number of points in it as a one-inch line, and a cube has the same number of points in it that a one-inch line does. That is because the, the infinite inset theory has been defined in a very precise way. Namely, uh, any set which has a proper subset which is equivalent to the original set is infinite. And when they say equivalent, it means you can have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the members of these two sets. And that's what you can do with the points in a one-inch line and the points in a cube. You can arrange a one-to-one -one correspondence so that every point in the line has a point in the cube and every point in the cube has a point in the line. So it isn't a matter of being undefined at all. On the contrary, th this result is precisely because of very specific definitions that have been given to the concepts of equivalence and size in mathematical set theory. Um, and one would only need to add that when we talk about the infinity of God's being, we're not using the words there in a mathematical sense. Uh, God is not a composite of definite and discrete, finite particulars, the way a set is, or a line is composed of points. So when theologians or philosophers talk about God's infinity, it's not a quantitative concept. It is, if you will, a, a qualitative concept. It means that God is holy, uh, perfect, um, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present, eternal, necessary. Infinity is just the, the umbrella term for all of these superlative attributes, which are not quantitative 
concept. So it's just a very different use of the word infinity than is used in set theory. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, it's a different definition. I mean, we use words in different ways in different fields. And when the mathematician talks about infinity, it is a very carefully defined quantitative concept. But when a, math, a, a theologian says something like, God is infinite love, he's not using that word in that mathematical quantitative way. He's using it in a more qualitative sense. Thank you. Uh huh. Well, that's too much math for me, but uh, thanks, for, um, <laughs> th uh, thanks for coming out here. I want to thank you. But I want to also ask, um, I guess I can't raise this, but I want to ask a possible logical uh, a fallacy, perhaps. Um, and I'm, unfortunately, much to the chagrin of my philosophy professor, I can't remember the uh, term for the exact fallacy, but yeah. um, I'm going to use a, maybe an analogy or a, a metaphor to fully bring it out. But um, so I've got this uh, muffler, right? And it won't go. It just won't you know, travel or I have, you know, maybe a wheel or something and it won't go. So I try to make it bigger and it still won't have the property of being able to propel itself forward. But then I take, you know, the different parts of a car together and put them together and then the part, the, the sum of the parts has a different property yes. than, you know, the individual parts. So the glass ball analogy, which Dr. Hiller, I think, was bringing up, um, by making the glass ball bigger won't necessarily um, be the correct analogy because the universe might be the sum of parts that has different properties than the yeah. individual. Okay, this is the, what you're referring to is the fallacy of composition. And that is relevant to my argument tonight, but not in the place that you think it was relevant. It's not relevant to the part about increasing the size of the ball so that the little ball needs an explanation, but the big ball no longer needs one. Because there, there's no composition, you see. We're just making the, th the thing bigger. There's no composition at all. Where it would be relevant would be my argument about the quarks. Because there, you remember, I was arguing that when you look at the things in the universe, nothing in the universe seems to be necessary. Galaxies, dust, radiation, comets, nothing seems to be necessary. So why think that the universe exists necessarily? And the, the proper response to that would be, Right, nothing in the universe, nothing of which the universe is composed is necessary, but the universe as a whole could still be necessary. And, and for me to reason from the contingency of the parts to the contingency of the whole, one might accuse me of committing the fallacy of composition. Do you see the relevance of your argument there? Yeah, so, so I, I just had a problem with the glass ball getting larger being the correct analogy for, you know, the, okay, the universe as a whole ought to be the same as enlarging one of its parts. Yeah, that's not the argument, though. They're, they're, I, I don't think it's, because I'm not compounding things. Um, it seems to me the universe could be a compilation of various things that has the properties different than the individual parts. Well, right, and, and I, I did try to respond to that. Well, let, let me, since you're not interested in this stuff about the quarks, let me just, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> because I think there, I think your argument is a good one there. But that's why I want to say I went to the quarks themselves and argued that the quarks aren't composed out of anything and that therefore if, if the quarks aren't necessary, then matter isn't necessary. If a different collection of quarks could have existed, you, you would have a different universe. So I, I tried to anticipate someone bringing up the fallacy of composition in the way I argued about the quarks. Uh, and gave the analogy of the steel shoes and the, the silk stockings being darned with wool and so forth. But to get back to the ball, no, there, there's just no reasoning by composition there. I, I'm not reasoning it because every part of the universe has an explanation, therefore the universe as a whole has an explanation. That's not the argument. And I, I did try to respond to the objection that the atheist might raise in saying everything in the universe has an explanation but the universe itself has no explanation. And I argued with Schopenhauer that that commits the taxicab fallacy, that it's arbitrary to exempt the universe from having an explanation. Um, and, and therefore, the atheist would have to give some reason for thinking that the universe is exempt. And remember, then I gave an, uh, uh, examined an argument from some atheists who say, well, the universe can't have an explanation because it would have to be something that exists without the universe and explains the universe, but if the universe didn't exist, that would just be nothingness and that can't explain anything. 
And I pointed out how that's question begging. That assumes the truth of atheism. So I think in the way I developed the argument, I did try to anticipate the problems that you raised, and I, I think that I answered them. Okay, thank you. like a lot of people have questions about the first premise. Uh, the first premise, I'm wondering if, if you don't believe that numbers exist or states of affairs or those kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, what would be the reason for saying that something uh, can exist of the necessity of its own nature or external cause? If we're looking to, what kind of finite thing would we be looking at to say, to come to the conclusion that these are the two logically exhaust, or these are uh -huh. two logically exhaustive categories uh, or why not? Why do we not? Why do we not just say um, anything that ha uh, ha anything that exists requires an explanation for its existence from an external cause? Yeah. Why? Why add the? Well, I, I think the concept of a being that exists in all possible worlds seems to be a coherent concept. And down through the history of philosophy, just multitudes of philosophers have identified different sorts of beings as being that kind of being. As I said. Uh, this, is, this is very prevalent in mathematics, but not only mathematics, but things like propositions, and you mentioned states of affairs, uh, uh, properties or universals are candidates for these things. God is a candidate for this. Um, so th this is a, a well-respected category of being in metaphysics. Now maybe the category is empty, maybe everything is contingent, but maybe not, and so we, I, I think it's a coherent category metaphysically, and we need to ask if there are any objects that fit into that category. But I don't think we can just say, no, this category doesn't exist, that this is impossible. There's no incoherence in the idea of a metaphysically necessary being. If you were an austere nominalist, would that just basically, would that undercut the argument? No, because as the philosophers will tell you who heard me this afternoon, I'm about as austere a nominalist as anyone can be. I don't believe in the existence of any of these abstract objects. I'm, I'm a concretist. I think that everything that exists is, is concrete, and I would even dare to, I would even go so far as to affirm that causality is a criterion of existence, that anything that exists must have the capacity to have causal impact upon other things. So, no, uh, it, it would just mean that the category of necessary being isn't filled by any of these abstracta. It would be some sort of a concrete being that might be necessary in its existence. And uh, my bet is that it's God, that God is a concrete, necessary being, a personal mind who has created the universe of contingent beings. Okay, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Interesting how these questions of nominalism come up tonight. Uh, fascinating. Okay, over here. Is that okay, Dr. Miller? Oh, All right, no. thanks. Thank you. <laughs> All right. um, I need some clarification on the Big Bang Theory, because as far as I know, the evidence supporting it um, are the low-frequency uniform radiation running around in space discovered by the forays into the field of telecommunications. And while this does support an explosion, it in no way insinuates that there was nothing before that mm -hmm. explosion. And without that nothing, we've neither seen the beginning nor the end of the yeah. universe. Yeah. Um, the discovery of the microwave background radiation that you referred to in 1965 was one of the dramatic confirmations. You're very well of, informed. Well, <laughs> thank you was one of the dramatic confirmations of the theory of the expanding universe. But in addition to that, there was also the redshift in the uh, light coming to us from distant galaxies. It shifted toward the red end of the spectrum, which indicates that as we look out into the night sky, everything is flying away from us at fantastic speeds. A third confirmation of the Big Bang theory or of the expanding universe was the discovery that the very light elements, the lightest of the elements on the periodic table, cannot be synthesized in the interior of stars. The temperatures are not hot enough. The deuterium, the hydrogen, had to be synthesized in an event of even hotter temperatures 
and greater densities that could only be present in the Big Bang itself. So we have very powerful evidence that the universe is expanding. And as you trace that expansion back in time, the universe gets denser and denser and denser until finally, within a finite amount of time, you arrive at a state of infinite density, which represents a space-time boundary. It is like the point of a cone. A point is a boundary point for a cone. A cone can be extended in the other direction, you know, the, the expanding direction, but you cannot extend a cone in the direction of which it has a boundary point. That is the absolute beginning. And as I said, what the Hawking-Penrose singularity theorem showed is that this initial singularity is unavoidable given some very general uh, conditions. So it's the evidence that you mentioned, as well as the galactic redshift and the synth nucleosynthesis of the light elements, that leads to the conclusion that the universe is in a state of cosmic expansion. And you trace that back in time, and it goes back to this absolute beginning point. Now, certainly a number of models have been proposed to try to avoid that singular beginning point. And uh, Hawking would be one of these persons, for example. But what you discover is that none of these models can be extended infinitely into the past. Even those that avoid a singular beginning point, like Hawking's own model, is still finite in the past. It still comes into being. And this theorem that was discovered in 2003 by Borg, Guth, and Vilenkin shows that any universe which is in a state of cosmic expansion on average throughout its history cannot be extended into the infinite past, but must have a boundary point at some point in the indefinite past. So this guth board vilenkin theorem has, again, provided very powerful evidence that, in fact, the universe is not infinite in the past, but does have a finite uh, point of origin or beginning point, even if that's not a singular point. Oh, come on, Miller. You're going <laughs> to let me respond, aren't you? What? Let, let me just say this. If you're interested in this, reading some more, uh, take a look at Alex Vilenkin's uh, new book, uh, Many Worlds in One, uh, published just last year. And there's also lots of material on my website as well that documents the, the current science on this. I'll be at the reception. OK. <laughs> Um, just as clarification, what exactly do you mean by these things? Well, um, I'm not meaning anything special. Uh, uh, some terms are so primitive they're hard to define, except by giving synonyms. I mean, uh, being, I mean what it is to say that something is. Um, um, Can you think of anything, Christian? For <laughs> how to, I mean, what do you mean by existence? Uh, is real? Does that help? It is real? That's what I mean? So if the universe is only in your mind and it's not real, then it does not exist? Right. So, so Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist. He's just a fictional character in your imagination. So how could you say that the universe is not in your mind? Excuse me? How can you say that the universe is not something that's only in your mind? Well, because the universe was long here on the scene before I or ever arrived. But the era of galaxy formation, <laughs> the Jurassic period, you know, I, all of that existed long before I arrived on the scene. It's not just in my mind. But time and everything in the past and like the concept of past and the concept of time and all that could be in your mind as well. Oh, I don't think so. I mean, don't you think that, that, uh, that, that say, Abraham Lincoln really existed, uh, you know, in 1860, that the Civil War really occurred, even though you weren't there yet? That uh, I think those things really happened. Uh, the past really did occur. There, time is an objective feature of the world uh, that doesn't depend upon our imagination. I mean, to suggest that this is a product of your imagination, I mean, think what that would imply. That would mean 
that Abraham Lincoln never really lived, that uh, uh, somehow you have brought these things into reality through your own imagination, that just strikes me as fantastic. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much.